We're looking at the third chapter, verses 1 through 3 today. It's a very simple passage that can correct a lot of complicated problems in marriage. If you would just pay attention to the simplicity of it. Paul talks about the simplicity and pure devotion to Christ. I always found that interesting, the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Well, in the third chapter, uh, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, remember that he is now going to attack the second chapter, verse 17, which was the word of God that had been sown, the word of God that had been taught at Bible study by the Lord in the garden. 2.17, don't eat of the tree. The day you eat, die, and you will die. And he's going to attack that doctrinal principle because it's the directive will of God. Satan is always targeting the directive will of God in your life. Always targeting it. You, you need to be aware of it. You go to Bible class and all of a sudden you get a, a, a scriptural revealing to your life of some biblical principle that is really important to you. You knew it when you heard it. You went, oh, I didn't know that before. <clears throat> the devil, what he is after is to get you out of doing the Lord's will <clears throat> in order to do his. Because you're going to do one of them. You're never neutral. <clears throat> so <clears throat> he's going to attack the revealed word of God that is important to the life of these two people, Adam and Eve, in the garden, uh, regarding 217. He, he begins, right? He begins with the woman. He attacks her volition and, and the directive will of God in her. He says, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Well, she understood verse 16, 216, and she's going to say that when he gave her 17, he gave her 16 and 17, which says, you can eat from all of the, any of the trees in the garden. Verse 17, except one. The tree of knowledge of good and evil, you cannot eat from it. The day you eat, die, and you will die. So the serpent attacks that. But he does it from the back door first. Watch what he does. Has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Isn't that interesting? He went negative on it, didn't he? Because he's, he's going to get her to try to get her off from the positive, don't eat from the tree. So he starts, he starts on the back door rather than the front door. The woman answered the serpent, from the, tree, from the fruit of the tree of the garden you may eat. She was correct. She had verse 16 down. <clears throat> but from the tree, and, she, and, and so she gives him a heads up on 17. But from the tree, but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. <clears throat> All right, that was the tree of knowledge business. <clears throat> All right, so now the devil is, is going is to knock on the front door. The serpent said to the woman, you shall surely not die. Now let me ask you a question. When he said that in the verse 17, he did that uniquely in the Hebrew. He said that unique in the Hebrew. Because it mean, what he used muth muth, which is the word for dying, he used it twice. Dying, you shall die. And in the Hebrew, you can do that when you have an infinitive and an imperfect. I'm just telling you how, it, and that's an absolute. <clears throat> that's an absolute truth. There's no varying in it. There's no light shade to it. It is an absolute truth. 
the day you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, dying you will die. Muth muth means there will be two deaths affected by it. One will be spiritual, separation from God in time, and the other will be physical death, separated uh, from people in time. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Whether you know the word, right? The devil, the devil knows what it's about, and his job, his game is to turn you away from the truth of the word of God. That's his game. If you don't have the truth, then he's got you already. But his deal is to turn you away from the truth of God, to turn you away from fellowship with God, turn you away from the teaching of God so that he can control your life and not God. One of two people is controlling your life. When you walk through that door, one of two people have been in control of your life this last week. And maybe it's been changed back and forth. Either God isn't doing it or the devil is doing it because there's no other person able to do that. The war is between God and Satan. The serpent said, you shall, you shall surely absolutely not die. For God knows that in any, and he gives her a reason. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil. Listen, are they already like God? Yes. Genesis 1, 26, 27, they've been made in the image according to the likeness of God, and they're not in a fallen state. Right? Now watch this. Here is an imagination gone wild. And it's promoted by devil. Imagination gone wild against the will of God. Watch this now. The woman saw... That, that's an imagination. She saw that the tree, the forbidden tree, that the forbidden tree was good for food. Is that true? It's a forbidden tree. You're not supposed to eat it at all, right? It's, it's the good tree of knowledge. And the knowledge is you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to eat from it, right? I mean, you can't, you're not going to the tree to get knowledge. You're going to the tree because you have knowledge. Knowledge don't come from trees. <laughs> I mean, you can sit among the forest all day long and be stupid. <laughs> it was good for food. Watch that. It was good for food. It's not good for food. You're not supposed to eat it. Don't eat from the tree of knowledge. You're going to eat it. So she saw that it was good for food. Is it good for food? Where'd she get that idea? In imagination. It's an imagination gone wild. Well, then, hmm. And that it was a delight to the eyes. And imagination gone wild now, right? All these connective ands. This is an imagination going wild, and that your tree was desirable to make one wise. You know where you get you, the wise that the Bible talks about? You get it from the Word of God. You don't get it from a pine tree or an oak tree, or especially a forbidden tree. So she took from it and ate, and also gave to her husband. Watch this. Who was what? Who was what? And what did he do? Did you read it? Here's where we're going today. Let me tell you about your relationship. It takes two to be one. Now, here's the problem. Let me tell you the problem, then I'll correct it. You think, as Christians, 
that compromise is how you resolve that when two people are not one on something. When two people aren't one on something, you think the answer is compromise. He's got an opinion, I have an opinion, we'll try to come to some kind of common ground in opinions, right? Is that compromise? Do you understand that principle? That's not biblical. Do you know where the two minds have to become one in mind? In Christ. He's got an opinion. She's got an opinion. What are you going to do with it? Well, we're going to fuss and fuss until we can compromise, and we're going to push and shove and scream until we get into compromise. You still haven't solved your problem. The problem that you started quarreling over and fussing about. The answer is for to two minds become one in Christ. Therefore, when you're out there and you're fussing and you're being polarized in your relationship, you should ask yourself, what does the Bible say? Is that a hard question to ask? What's the Bible say? Both of you turn your mind to what the Bible says, and then what should you do when you see the answer in the Bible? What should you do? You should do it. We don't live that way in the church anymore. We live by absolute compromise that never works and winds up in divorce or separations. Because one person always feels they're always giving in to the other person and neither are giving in to the Lord. Got to quit that. Psychology may tell you that's the way you solve problems, but I'm telling you it's not for the church. That's for the world. Not for the church. Two minds have to become one in Christ. Well, okay. First Corinthians two. Paul talks about the natural man and how he thinks and how he deals with issues in his life. And he compares him to the person who is born again and spiritual and how he deals with problems in his life. Now watch this. Because apparently many of you are not getting this. Because you're going the world way to compromise problems in your life. You're not going the Bible way. It's a simple answer to your problems in your marriage. What does the Bible say? And then what should you do when you find the answer? You should do it. There's no victory in just learning it. You've got to learn to do it and see God show up and show out because God honors his word. So here we are in verse 14. The natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. The natural man. Now he's talking about an unbeliever and he's going to go on to talk about this for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. He's not going to search that out because he's got no reason to. He's not spiritual. He's natural. He's not interested in the spiritual things. It's, not, it's not of no great interest to him. And so he's never, he's, that's, that the, the Bible is going to be the last place the natural man looks for a solution to his problem. He's going to look to the worldview. He's not going to look to the divine view. He's going to look to the worldview. When you look to the worldview, you have just stepped into cosmos diabolicus. When you step into word, you've just stepped into divine viewpoint. 
That's why it's important. That's why we have a completed scriptures. We have a completed Bible. Do you realize how fortunate we are to have a completed Bible? Nobody in the Old Testament had a completed Bible. Nobody that's talked about in the New Testament had one. It was in the process of being made. We're the most privileged people in the whole world of the civilization of believers. We live in the most wonderful time, spiritually speaking, that you could live. Just open the Bible and you got your answers. We don't do that. We don't do that. We should, but we don't. What's the Bible say? Find it. If you got a good study Bible, you can concordance in the back. You can find anything with a good Bible and a concordance. And if you can't, your concordance is not big enough, get a strong, a strong concordance. It'll take you Old Testament, New Testament, Hebrew, and Greek. It'll do the whole ball game for you. My, my, my. In verse 15, he shows you where the answer is to us spiritual people. But those who are spiritual, born again, understanding the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. See, see the word appraised? See how it's being used in 14, 15, and 16? Then in verse 16, he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When you go to the Bible for the answer, you have the mind of Christ. When you both set your mind on it, you have now turned to the mind of Christ. You've turned off your opinion and turned to Christ's opinion that you're going to take it. And it resolves this idea, well, it's your, that's your opinion. Why don't you listen to my opinion? Listen, set them both aside and go to what does the Bible say and find the opinion of Christ. When you do, you have the mind of Christ, then embrace it. I ain't had prayer yet, have I? Yeah. I don't say prayer. As a believer, you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. If you want anything out of this lesson, you can't, you can't learn it in the flesh. You cannot learn it in the flesh. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit to make you spiritually appraised. You can appraise anything in your life by the Word of God. I mean, you bring a, a car in, you want it appraised. Why? It's where the value is, the appraisal value. Now look, if you're going to study with us, you've you got to be sure there's no unconfessed sin in your life so that you can be restored to fellowship. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. That's the blood of Christ working in the Christian life to bring us back to where the Holy Spirit can teach us some truth. The truth is what sets you free. Only the Bible can give you absolute truth. Every, everybody else has got relativity. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence to do your business. Confess your sins, mental attitude, sins, sins of the tongue, avert sins. And then get let the Holy Spirit teach you some things today that is relevant to your life. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you did with your son sending him to the cross and his obedience to the word of God. To move us out of the natural realm into the spiritual realm in life. Help us, Father, to understand in marriage the importance of two becoming one in Christ. One mind in Christ. One life in Christ. One will in Christ. One work in Christ. May we come to understand this, Father. The church is being racked with divorce, separations, the parting of the ways. My goodness, Father, help us understand some things about marriage in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me go to my paper. 
We, we have been in a study since Christmas on this subject. I'm extending it a little further along because I got the third chapter of Genesis. Our study actually started in Genesis uh, many moons ago. So we learned in the Bible, we learned biblical math about marriage. We learned that one and one equals one. This idea of getting polarized and separating each other and being married and acting like you're single is stupid, right? I'm not saying you are, I'm saying it is. Stupid. And how are you going to be in marriage? How are you going to stay one? One and one is one. You were single. He was single. You got married. Now you're one, the Bible says, right? Well, Genesis 2.24, we have already read that about marriage. In, in the identity of marriage, the two become what? One. You must strive for that in your marriage. You must strive to be one. Let me tell you how I know it's not there. Here is one-on-one -on -one counseling with Ron Adema. You pray together? Huh? You pray together? You pray, he prays, we pray. You know who ought to lead that charge? The male ought to lead it. They ought to lead that charge. If not, somebody's got to lead it. You should pray together. Why is it that you don't pray together? You talk to each other every once in a while, right? You can disagree and talk. You can shout at each other. There are a lot of things you can do. How come you don't pray together? You think prayer is important in your life? Apparently not. Well, you only pray in emergency cases? Huh? It's the only time you pray? Never pray together? How is it you never pray together? You're supposed to be one, and you're supposed to be one mind in whom? One mind in Christ. You think Christ prayed with his disciples? Think he led that charge? It's unacceptable. You can shout at each other. You can browbeat each other. You can do all these kinds of things. You can't pray together. I'm terribly wrong with this picture. If you came to me in marital counseling, you know the first thing I would tell you, do you need to start praying together? You dating? You like each other? How come you not you believers? How come you not praying together? You say, Well, I don't know. You know how to talk? If you know how to talk, you know how to pray. Once you, except you talk to the Lord. You should do this. How, how, how are you going to ever get into one mind? You got to all this Bible doctrine, and you never talk about it. You never, you never pray over it. You never pray with it. You do everything else together you want to do, but this is a, a missing link in your life? Come on. Come on. Listen, here we let, well, I gave you stats about where we're headed as a nation. The majority of Americans today in America believe in the monogamous marriage. They also believe in no-fault divorce. Which means if, if I get unhappy, I can walk away. The Bible makes it clear you cannot, for any reason at all, 
with no reason at all, just get a divorce. And uh, America has accepted that, and so is the church. And it's wrong in the church. It's wrong. When you read Matthew, the 19th chapter, and Jesus is talking about marriage, he talks about this no-fault divorce issue with the phrase called no reason at all. And we talked about that. And let me tell you, it is a clear sign of the decadence on the decadency of a declining nation in America called America. It's an attack upon divine institutions. And boy, we're up to our eyebrows in it. So let me talk about three things today in the hour I have. Less than that now. Jesus made a discussion on this very subject and two questions to us. In Matthew, the 19th chapter, which we have already studied, I'm bringing this back to your attention. He says, when he was talking about, people come to him to talk about divorce, and he said the subject ought to be about marriage, not divorce. If you understood marriage, then you would understand about divorce, but you want me to address divorce and you don't understand marriage, so I'm going to address marriage. That's Matthew 19. And here's what he says. He says, have you not read? You know what he's talking about? He's talking about, he's talking about grace, but he's talking about the Bible. Have you not read in the Bible? What's the Bible say is what he's saying. What does the Bible say? So he tells them, have you not read that? He who created them from the beginning made them male and female. See, we're in Genesis 1, and then he's going to go to Genesis 2. See, when he says that, he's talking about Genesis 1, 26, 27. Don't you know that God made you in the image according to the likeness of God? He made you male and female in the image according to the likeness of God. That's where your compatibility is. You don't marry a sheep, a dog, or cat, or a fish. Because they're species. Well, anyhow, at least not yet. Have you not read that he who created from the beginning them male and female? And, and he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. I like the old day when we talked about leave and cleave. I just love that pair. Leave and cleave. I mean, it just rhymes and goes together in my mind. So I like that. Leave and cleave. All right? And he said, for this reason, so he goes from Matthew 1 to Matthew 2, because now he's in Matthew 2, 18 through 25 on marriage. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother, and he will cleave or be joined to, the word cleave, or be joined to his wife in the Lord is the idea. And the two shall become one flesh. I told you before when we studied this passage a couple weeks ago that Jesus introduces a newology. I put N-E-O-L-O-G-Y, a newology. He attached a phrase to Genesis 2, 18 through 25, to bring you updated on marriage because he was in a nation in decline like we are. And here's what he said. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And here's what he said. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder or separate. That is not in Genesis 2. 24, 25. It's, it's a newology. It's something Jesus attached where a nation was going crazy on divorce and ignoring everything the Bible said about marriage. 
He said, the missing problem is you don't understand marriage and you don't understand the longevity of it and the warfare that's connected to it in the angelic conflict. And he says, here's the bottom line, you know, always looking for a bottom line. What God has joined together, let no one separate. Not even you. Not even you. So that's pretty hard stuff. So in Matthew 19, 7, a question. They ask him, why then did Moses permit legal divorce? Deuteronomy 24. Jesus answered, Matthew 19, 8, be, watch this, because of the hardness of man's heart. He gave him one answer. He gave him one answer. Because of the hardness of men's heart against what? The truth of the Word of God. The Bible. What's the Bible say? I don't care what the Bible says. I'm going to do it anyhow. I don't care. Well, there will be consequences. I don't care. Bring it on. All right. All right. Yeah. That's hard. Listen, the, here's how we identify the average guy. Here's how we had it. We call it, we, we call this hard headed. The Bible calls it the hardness of the heart. Where you know what is truthful, you understand it, and you're not going to do it, and you don't care what, he, what, what anybody says about it. I don't care. What a terrible place to be in. How are you going to walk that out? How are you going to walk that out, dear hearts? Jesus said, because of the hardness of men's heart, but from the beginning, when God established marriage, but from the beginning, it had not been this way. And he goes back to Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Your marriage conflicts has an easy solution, and you don't want them. That's why you still have marriage conflict. <clears throat> If you open the Bible and you put laid down your conflict next to the Bible, he would tell you how to correct it. If you laid hers down on the Bible, God would tell her exactly what she has to do is correct it. But you don't want to go to the Bible to correct it. When you go to the Bible to get the answers, you, you bold your back up. which is a sign of becoming hard-hearted. And you're not going to take the advice of the Bible. You're not going to listen to God, and you think you're going to climb out of this mess in your marriage or your relationship. And you are hell-bound to destroy it and become another stat in a declining nation and the fix is easy. You just don't want it. The fix is easy. You don't want it. How is that possible? I'll tell you why. Because you've stuck your head in the world and you don't care what the Bible says. You don't care. Do you suppose God knows? Oh yeah, but I don't care. <laughs> okay. I mean, how do you talk to a person like that? How do you talk to them? Let me tell you about the hardness of hearts. Let me just give you a quick, simple, what does it mean to have a hardness of heart? Let me just be really simple with you. I'm going to walk you through what's going on in your life. Number one, watch this now. Here's the, there's, I'm going to talk about two little phases. And I'm, I'm really being simple about this. It starts with negative volition to the directive will of God. Well, Eve, what did, the, what did God tell you about the tree? 
of knowledge of good and evil, right? Did she have a clear understanding of it? Yes, she did. She knew she wasn't supposed to eat it, and then she added not even to touch it. She knew. Negative relation to directive will of God leads you to the next thing. Leads you to this. Watch it now. Subjective thinking. How you feel over what you should believe. Well, I don't care what the Bible says. I like what I'm doing, and I'm going to keep on doing it. Yes, but it's wrecking your marriage. I don't care. My, my, my. My, my, my. Now, I'm thankful you still come to church. I'm still thankful you're coming to church. But if you're looking for the easy way out, you're not going to find it here. We're going to tell you the absolute truth, and we're going to tell you how to fix it. You should fix it yourself. Subjective thinking about how you feel over what you should believe. What's the Bible say? Well, buddy, what's the Bible say? I know what your wife says, but what's the Bible say? Well, what's your, I know what your husband says, but what does the Bible say? <laughs> Because we need to be on the same page. We need to be in the same mind of Christ. We can solve these marital problems in a heartbeat. Subjective thinking, subjective thinking, which is feeling about the will of God. I know what the will of God is, but I don't care. I'm not going to do it. Now, how are you going to deal with him? What is that a sign of? Listen to me. It's a sign of hardening of the heart. It's a sign of the hardening of the heart towards God. Look where, look where that goes. Watch this now. I'm moving down the pike with it. Negative volition goes into subjective, th subjective thinking, goes into looking for alternatives or substitutes for what you think you're not getting. And you're going to the wrong well to drink, buddy. You're going to the wrong well to drink, young lady. You're going to the wrong well to drink. You think you're going to find happiness as well. I, I, it, uh, it solves it for the day. Yeah, right. It cre listen, it creates problems. It don't solve them. Oh, my, my, my. Am I talking to anybody here today? Looking for alternatives, this is the next step. You're looking for the, you know why you do? Listen to me. Because when you turn your back on the revealed will of God, a vacuum opens in you. The Bible calls it mateetes. A vacuum opens in you. You're open for anything. And the devil is right there to see that you can get whatever you want for now because what he's after is put a fish hook in your mouth so that he can pull you into his arena so that he can hold you captive to do his will. Write this down. Write this down. 2 Timothy 2.26. God wants you to do his will. Satan wants you to do his will. Now whose will are you doing? If you're going against what the Bible says, guess whose will you're doing? You're doing God's will? No, you're not. What do you mean, yeah? What do you mean, yeah? My, my, my. Now watch, there's a second phase now because we're going to alternatives. We're looking for alternatives. Oh, I, you know, I'm so unhappy if I got another job. Oh, I'm so unhappy if I got another wife. Oh, I'm so unhappy. I, da, 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 da. So you look for alternatives. And where do you go? You go to the Bible? No, I'm shut down. And then I'm not listening. I'm not, sure. I'm not going to pastor and listen to that stuff. When you do that stuff, you've opened up to the world. The devil's got more alternatives than your heart could ever desire. And they're all to tank you. Every bit of it is to destroy your life. 
your marriage, your children, as much as he can get a hold of that's in your possession, he wants to destroy it. Do you not understand that? He wants to destroy it. He don't want anything in your life that is a symbol of God. I'm not fussing at you so much as I am him. I'm fussing a little bit today, but... Now watch, once you get into that vacuum idea of I'm open for options, cosmos diabolicus, that's the devil's system of filling up holes in your life with alternatives to God and the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. It's worldly thinking. Worldly thinking is squirrely thinking. It is promoted by Satan as the alternative. When you get into that, it shuts down, inhale, exhale, of the Word of God in your life because you're opposed to it. You shut down in one area, it's shut down in all the areas. Or you can play the church game. I'm talking about the real deal here. It shuts down, inhale, exhale, of 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. It shuts it down. And when you do, it shuts down the truth of life, the truth of life that should be carrying you down from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday to Thursday. That's what truth, that's what God's truth does. It, it sells your ship in the correct direction. You shut it down. Now you're open to run in every direction. You don't like jumping on a horse and riding in every direction at the same time. And so it leads you into a cosmos diabolicus way of life. And when that happens, callousness begins to build in your life towards God. A callousness to the Word of God. A callousness to do the things that you know God wants you to do. A callousness to pray. A callousness to confess sin. A callousness. A callousness. And a callousness. You, you know, you ever, you, you ever gone out and worked in something? You, you, my grandfather would always shake a man's hand and know what kind of work he did, right? And whether he had calluses, whether he was a blue collar or a white collar. Two men standing there, both had good jobs. You could tell by the guy who was grunting every day who had the calluses all over his hands. But you could pick the blue collar worker out right away. Today we couldn't because nobody works anymore. Callousness to the things of God, the callousness results in the hardening of the heart. You become callous and then you become hardened in your heart. When Jesus went, watch this now. When Jesus went through in, 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 in uh, uh, Luke 4, I put it on your paper. I, I took Luke's account of it. In Luke 4, when Jesus went through the temptation, you know, the 40 days in the wilderness and the devil tempted him, right? They had to put him through the three tests. And he beat him. Jesus won everyone. He, he hit him. You know, the devil only has three plays. I just just came off a study on that on Tuesday. Hey, if you're, if you're ever out someday and you want lunch, uh, uh, 12 to 1, we give you lunch here and but you have to listen to me for an hour. It's, it's not. It's, not, it's cheap, but it's not free. So, my, my lesson is, but I'm just making a point. Do you know how that? Do you know how that whole? Do you know how that whole thing ended? Watch this. Yeah, you Bible. Watch this now. Apparently, I'm not going to get much farther. So, let's look at this. Look at Luke four. We've gone through the temptation. And Jesus has beat, beat the devil. He's beat him. You say, well, yeah, he was Jesus. But he, he didn't use anything that you can't use to beat him. He used the same method that you must use to beat the devil. You know, the devil has three plays, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. He's going to get you with one of them. Well, when he gets through with this whole thing, look at verse 13. Watch this now. Watch this now. This is really important to your life. 
when the devil had finished every temptation, he hit him one, two, and three, hit him one, one, two, and three. He, the devil, left him, watch this, until an opportune time. He is always reconnaissant of an opportune time. Right? Well, you don't want him to live with you in your house. You don't want the devil in the middle of your marriage. You don't want the devil in the middle of your relationship, in your family, in your business, whatever. He gets his foot in one area, he's got it in every area. Because he got it in your life. And whatever your life touches, he's got it. My, my, my. My, my, my. Well, I'm out of time. You can read, so I, here's a very interesting, let me tell you, here's an interesting one. Don't, you, don't read the whole story. Ananias and Sapphira. In Acts 5, 1 through 11, you need to read that in regard to what, and they were married. And see how they divided. They came of one mind, both against God. Think about that now. Ananias and Sapphira, you read it in my context, you will find something really interested in it. And listen, so did Adam and Eve. Rather than go one mind in Christ, right? They did the same thing. They did the same thing. They conspired together against God's will, just like Ananias and Sapphira. Be sure to read that. It's a good read. Well, let's have word of prayer. The men will take the offering. And then we'll have a break, 15-minute break, and we'll come back to the second lesson. So let's pray. Well, Father, we said what we were supposed to say when the limited time we had. We don't, we don't really believe that there is ever a limited time, Father. We live in the fullness of time. So what had to be said and the way it had to be said and taught, we take it as the fullness of the time. I pray, Father, we've got to get serious on having a happy home. One content with the things of God. Not looking for alternative places to find happiness and contentment and peace of mind that's not scripturally accessible. At some point, we've got to get tired of hearing it, hearing it, hearing it over and over and do something about it. It's time to act upon the word of God. It's time to apply the faith cycle in our life. It's not enough just to hear the word. It's not enough even just to believe it. We've got to put it in exercise of the practical exercise of our daily life. I lift our marriages before you, Father, both in this church and all the churches, especially St. Clair County. St. Clair County, Father. It's where we are. We need to rescue these. Children are suffering from it because parents are just swallowed up in their own stuff. We've got to quit that. We've got to begin having ministries in our home, in our businesses, in our schools to influence people for Christ. And it's got to be real. None of this phony baloney. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen.